And now I would like to introduce a woman who has become my friend, who is um, head of programming for the Chappaqua Garden Club, who is sponsoring this program. So please welcome Jennifer Prizer. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, um, Ellen Ecker Ogden. And Ellen is a kitchen designer and author of the book, The New Heirloom Garden, Designs, Recipes, and Heirloom Plants for Cooks Who Love to Garden. The book is a beautiful book. It's got amazing recipes and photographs inside. Um, Ellen is, has also authored other books as well, uh, featuring ki kitchen gardens, so check those out. Um, Ellen co-founded the Cook's Garden Seed Catalog, which introduces cooks and gardeners to European specialty vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Ellen graduated with a degree in fine arts, attended cooking school in Marcella Haz with Marcella Hazan in Venice, Italy, and at the Bal Bal Balmo Palmoli School in Ireland. Her articles and kitchen garden designs have appeared in numerous national publications, including the New York Times, Martha Stewart Living, Better Homes and Gardens, just to name a few. So thank you, Ellen, for speaking with us today. Please, everybody, use the chat function to ask any questions, and we will do our best to get them all answered. Also, please check out um, the Chappaqua Garden Club website. We have lots of fun upcoming programs happening, uh, chappaquagardenclub.com, and you can see what events we have coming. And thank you, Joan, for being such a great partner. I appreciate that. And Ellen, we turn it over to you. Uh, well, before you will go, yeah. did you want to mention about the fact that I sent out the uh, handouts? Yes. There okay. is a handout that was sent out. Um, it was sent out before, um, right before, probably a half an hour before. So check your email and um, you can refer to your handout um, as well. That's it. So thank you, Alan. Turn it over to you. Well, okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for that lovely introduction. Um, and for asking me to give this presentation today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Marcella Hazan School and the Bally Malo School, um, but I also just want to say I'm a kitchen garden designer, not a kitchen designer, but I kind of wish I were a kitchen designer. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, but today I'm going to talk about kitchen garden designs and the new heirloom garden, which is the name of my new book and what is an heirloom garden. And um, I want to say thank you to Joan. Uh, we were chatting a little bit before this and there's so many wonderful programs. You're so lucky and fortunate to have Joan um, creating these videos for you to be able to, to watch. So without further ado, I'm going to get started with the new heirloom garden. Um, this is actually my first talk of the season, so I'm excited to be able to share. And um, I, I must say that this is kind of how I feel this time of year. I can't stop gardening. Of course, I can't get out and garden. I'm in Vermont right now, and we just had 10 inches of fresh snow. But it's it's starting, I feel like my dormancy is starting to wake up when I prepare talks for you um, about the kitchen garden and, and, some, and start thinking about ideas and design. So I hope that after this lecture, you're, this is how you're going to feel. Um, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself, um, how I started doing kitchen garden design. I actually went to art school. Um, and graduated with a double degree in fine arts and art history. And then I married a Vermonter and he wanted to move to Vermont to his grandfather's farm and grow organic vegetables. Um, and I had a small design business after I graduated from school. And so I thought, well, that might be nice, a nice way to um, you know, live. And so we moved to Vermont, but I had no interest in gardening. I was working with fabrics, um, gardening looked like a lot of hard work and and dirty soil and you know he'd come in at the end of the day and drop his muddy boots in the front hall and I'd just kind of take them to the washing machine and it was just it was not what I wanted to do at all but I really loved the food that he grew and by and by we had a little farm stand and we called it the cook's garden because I loved growing I loved cooking all the vegetables that he brought so it was a pretty good partnership where he was the gardener and I was the cook so we called our our farm stand the cook's garden um, but we live in southern Vermont and 
our hometown had about 1200 people and so it was pretty hard at the end of the day when we'd set up the farm stand with all these beautiful organic local vegetables and nobody was really interested in organic local vegetables back in 1980 but we persevered and um, eventually found our way um, but I continued to try and sell these beautiful vegetables by coming up with recipes and having recipe cards at the farm stand and encouraging people to try something new. Um, my husband grew a lot of lettuce and salad greens. That seemed to be a specialty because in Southern Vermont at the time, we have changed now our zones, but at the time it was zone three, which meant that we had a frost pretty much every month of the year. It was pretty challenging to, um, to grow tomatoes and eggplants. He put up plastic greenhouses in order to do that. Um, but we grew a lot of uh, specialty greens. Uh, we were, we uh, found some, some European seed houses and we were buying things um, such as this beautiful mosh, mash, uh, also known as lamb's, uh, lamb's um, oh, I, I'm feldsalat, um, it, which is a European green that you see all over Europe, but very rarely do you see it here. Um, and arugula, which really wasn't very well known in the 1980s, um, but it has now, of course, become a mainstream. Well, we were starting to import a few seeds and uh, suddenly my husband had this idea that he wanted to import a lot of seeds. And um, so we, we filled up our living room with about 100 kilos of, of wonderful European heirloom varieties and started a seed catalog called the Cook's Garden. And we called it the Cook's Garden because I was the cook and he was the gardener. And I still wasn't much of a, of a, of a gardener, but I really did appreciate the, the wonderful heirloom varieties that the, the true sweet Genovese basil and um, heirloom tomatoes, of course, were a big deal. Um, so there were a lot of wonderful things that we were discovering. And back then, if you remember 1980, those of you who, who were gardening back then, iceberg lettuce was still the big thing for everybody making salads. And so coming up with some of these wonderful uh, French mescaline mixes uh, for our seed catalog was, was really what, what intrigued me. Um, but my job as the cook also involved going out into the garden and tasting everything and coming up with a description because we didn't really start doing a color catalog till about 10 years into the catalog. We still had black and white, um, you know, we just couldn't afford to do the color photo Photographs. And furthermore, we kind of thought that they weren't necessary if we could come up with a language for food and how to describe certain flavors. So when you look at this beautiful little lettuce on the left hand side, this salad bowl of spring greens, there's the Claytonia, which has a very lemony citrus flavor. And then the Cheriola chicory, which has a bitter um, um, tart flavor. And then the, the trout back lettuce, which um, is also um, quite an exceptional lettuce, because if you can't just if you want to grow red lettuce or green lettuce, you can grow trout back, which, which combines the two. So there were a lot of wonderful things about these different salad greens, but I needed to come up with a vocabulary as well as recipes. Um, we had a pretty sophisticated uh, customer who had traveled to Europe and um, I had never gone to Europe at that time. Um, and so I was a little stumped by some things like purple artichokes and chicories. We carried four pages of chicories and only those people who had experienced Italian chicories really knew what to do with chicories. And the only recipes I could come up with were, were things like you take that beautiful radicchio, which is called Rosa de Verona, and um, it's an heirloom variety and it takes about oh I'd say six months to grow it because it grows up like a little red lettuce and then you cut it back and then it comes up again looking like a radicchio but but um, it really it only worked about three out of ten times and so gourmet magazine told me to cook that radicchio by cutting it in half and grilling it on the the grill to blacken it and then put a creamy dressing on it that would take away the bitterness and I knew that was not the right way to be eating this beautiful radicchio so so I signed up to go to cooking school um, in Italy with Marcella Hazan. 
Um, it was a wonderful experience. It was, you know, one of those recreational cooking classes. It was really only in about 10 days, I think. But 10 days in Venice was enough to, to make me realize that I had a lot to learn about Italian food and vegetables. And, and you know, of course, um, one of the things about Marcella and, and many wonderful Italian cooks is that they don't try and pack in 20 ingredients into a recipe. They really highlight four or five and really bring out the flavors of those vegetables. Vegetables. And that was a really good learning experience for me. Um, and it also simplified the way I cook because I didn't want to spend a lot of time um, gathering ingredients and then following the recipe and forgetting something if, it, if the recipe was too long. I really preferred to, to be cooking from the garden and having a fresh light style. And somebody else in class had told me about this other school um, that I went to the following year called the Bally Malo School in Shanagary, Ireland. Now, the, the, it was quite a, a, a switch from going from Italy to Ireland. And of course, there were lots of jokes before I went that people would say, oh, you're going to go learn how to cook cabbage and potatoes. But of course, when I landed, it was so much more than, than just a cooking school. It was really a place where they honored um, growing food and tasting food. And in this gorgeous kitchen garden is where I decided to become a gardener. It, it was a journey that started really with uh, walking through that lovely hedge and hearing the birds singing and smelling the fragrant boxwood and tasting the tarragon right in the garden and then being able to harvest the herbs and bringing them into the kitchen and cook with them and, and share that experience with other students. It was, it was really enlightening to me. And I realized that if I could grow a beautiful garden, something like the gardens at Ballymolo School, that I wanted to learn how to be a gardener. So, um, of course, the first thing I did is I wrote home and I threatened my husband. And I said, unless you can take down those plastic greenhouses where you're growing your eggplants and your tomatoes, um, I'm not coming home because I want to use that space for a kitchen garden. Um, and of course, the kitchen garden, what is a kitchen garden? Well, a kitchen garden, in, to my mind, is not a victory garden, which we had, which was, we were growing everything. We were growing corn, tomatoes, squash, you know, peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, lettuce, everything. Everything. But really what I wanted was a beautiful kitchen garden, maybe not quite on the scale of this one at Bally Malo, but something that was smaller where I could go out and harvest my fresh herbs and salad greens. I didn't have to grow everything. Um, so step one was design. How do you figure out the design? Well, I was an artist and I had some art history background. So I knew that um, if I went back in time, I could, I could look at pictures. And um, it was before the internet, but I started to look at other designs to figure out what constitutes a beautiful kitchen garden. Um, always keep something beautiful in your mind was, was, was my uh, philosophy. And, um, <clears throat> this is not my garden that I ended up with. I, I wish it were, but in Vermont, we don't have this much flat space. I, I believe this is a, a garden in Kentucky somewhere, but um, it was designed by Rosemary Beery, who is one of my absolute favorite garden designers. I have several of her books and, and I love the way she's brought art into this garden. Um, by different things like the classic focal point. Notice the white bench at the end of that long alley and the orchard and the, the square plots around the trees that creates a geometrical pattern. And, and then notice the white tutors in the front, the obelisks, where they aren't growing anything up them. They're not really very practical, but they add a little height and drama to the design. And then notice again the white bench and, and the greenhouse, which is of course lovely. And then the the square gardens that are divided into triangles instead of squares. And, and with my art background, I knew that what I really wanted to do was, was design an artful kitchen garden, not just an ordinary practical garden, something like this, which is also not my garden. Um, but this has a lot of the elements that we're going to be talking today about um, about today, um, the garden gate, the fence, the wildflowers in the background that bring in the pollinators and the, the Buddha under the tree. Um, but this is really where I want to take you to in your mind's eye is to a garden that's about the same dimensions. It's not a 
huge garden, but it's a it's an exciting garden. It's a sanctuary. It's a place you want to go and step inside, go under the the arbors and sit on a bench and just spend some time. And it it's a garden that has texture and color and fragrance and all the things that I I experienced at the Bally Malo School. So um, you know, for most of us, we have to ask this question, where do ideas come from? Well, for me, ideas are always popping around, but how do I actually take those ideas and put them um, to, to good use? And so I started by um, going to visit a lot of gardens. I visited a lot of the gardens on the Open Conservancy tours and um, called people and said, do you have a garden? Can I come see it? I had a, a huge education. I didn't go to, you know, of learning how to do gardens. I didn't have time to go to Hort School. Um, I had a business going at the time and and it just didn't seem to make sense but I did learn by visiting gardens that I could take these same six steps to success design beds paths fences plants and personality that I was seeing in a lot of flower gardens and classic perennial gardens and estate gardens and I could put those to good use in a kitchen garden where I was growing food um, because I was a cook and I really wanted to grow food it kind of was 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 my my expression of, of, of growing a beautiful garden. Um, so it really starts by, by thinking about a sense of place, visualizing in your mind what you want for your garden. This is Kathy La Liberté's garden in, in um, Heinsberg, uh, Vermont. And I love how she's placed her greenhouse, which is a beautiful greenhouse. It's not a fancy Lord and Burnham greenhouse, but it's a very practical um, greenhouse. And she's placed it in the garden and then surrounded it with plants. So it creates a wonderful sense of place. Um, and I've been teaching an online garden program that is all about teaching the sense of place and how do you how do you start with design um, and starting with design really starts with a design on paper it's really not fair that the seed catalogs have been bombarding us with with all of these uh, gorgeous color photographs and um, I, I usually put them in a pile until I have my design figured out on paper and then I go back and I figure out where I'm going to put everything. Um, because really starting with a design on paper is the best way to set up a foundation. But so going back in time when I was looking for design ideas and inspiration for my first book, The Complete Kitchen Garden, which was published in 2011, I went back into history and, and learned about the early earliest kitchen gardens and and you know we've been growing food since you know somebody figured out one of the first you know hunter gatherers figured out that that seeds will grow into a plant and then you can eat it and that's another um, part of history but really the beautiful garden designs that were documented were were known as the paradise gardens in ancient persia and these gardens were based on a four square design that were based on the east west north and south the, the places in the world where where the some people would travel to and bring back plants and they could plant their gardens with these wonderful worldly um, plants but also they had uh, the 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 were divided those four squares by water the four sacred liquids of life water honey um, milk and wine and so these gardens were not just about growing food but were about connections were about nature and poetry and love and family and music and prayer and really embodied the whole nature of food that nourishes us on on so many levels and then fast forward to the medieval times when when everything uh, beautiful was really taken away um, from so many people and and many of the beautiful gardens were were set up in monasteries so the nuns and monks could maintain the these beautiful spaces again for meditation and prayer and they grew uh, uh, medicinal herbs and and uh, grains for breads and livestock and really they became a, a source of, of nourishment on so many levels 
And then when you fast forward to the, the Renaissance, the grand gardens at the Chateau de Villandry and, and Versailles and, and the, the grandiose of the gardens and these are red and green cabbages here. And um, again, I, hadn't, I haven't been to France, but I, I know about these gardens and I'm hoping to visit next fall. But these gardens were really about that four square design that we saw in the ancient paradise gardens. And, and that four square design Design is repeated in many variations in this garden. Um, and then when you go to Colonial Williamsburg, which, which is closer to, um, to um, our, our time now, these beautiful kitchen gardens also have that four square design. So again, going back to my original book in 2011, The Complete Kitchen Garden, this green one right here, um, I've discovered that the four square design was a very useful concept of being able to take these, these grand ideas and bring them into a home garden and make it beautiful. Because for me as an artist, I think when you make a garden beautiful, it creates um, a, a sanctuary. It creates a place that is more than just growing food. It's, it, for me, it turns work into play. It's a place that I can enjoy and spend time instead of going out and weeding. Oh my God, I have to go weed the garden. No, I get to go sit in the garden and be in the garden and be with the birds and, and all the other creatures that love to, to spend time in my garden. And so that four square design, this is um, my garden in the spring when I'm laying out my paths, um, is really what I've come down to for my own garden. In 2003, I moved to a smaller um, acreage. Instead of the 10 acre farm, I now have less than a quarter acre in the village of Manchester, Vermont. And every year I play with my four square design and design it in different ways. And one of the beauties of a four square is that it follows a crop rotation, which is an old, old practice that, that um, organic gardeners use that build the soil and keep the plants healthy. Instead of growing the, the same thing in the same place every year, uh, a gardener will grow legumes, those beans and, and peas that set nitrogen into the soil and have um, nitrogen nodules that will then feed the, the soil so that the leafy greens will follow the legumes the following year and be able to benefit from, from the high nitrogen content of the soil. And the legumes will go to where the root crops had been the, the year before. And those root crops have been absorbing a lot of nutrients from the soil and they, the legumes will build that soil up again. So this four square organic rotation is an old, old fashioned yet, yet very current way of, of regenerative agriculture that a home gardener can, can use. Um, and so this is what my garden looked like at the end of, of last season, actually, um, with that four square. And I, I must admit that I don't always follow the four square precisely, but I do try and put uh, plants together because I think plants like to be with other like plants. It's, they're kind of like people. And when you can think like a plant and think about what it really likes, I think you'll have a healthier garden. So step number two in my design uh, learning was to learn about garden beds. And so often I see gardeners going out and getting, putting together these, these raised beds um, and putting them in a place that, that may or may not you know, be appropriate. And I've really learned that when you design a garden with the proper beds, it really adds a, so much more to the landscape. And um, my garden is what I call the, the standard agriculture bed, which is not a raised bed. I, I like being able to step inside the garden and, and turn over the soil very gently in the spring and, and change the crops around and, and do my crop rotation. Yet so many people really believe in doing these raised beds. Again, this, this idea of, a, of the garden as a blank canvas of ideas when you have a, a, a piece of soil that's not confined to a raised beds, you have the opportunity to play with it each year because many of the crops we're growing in a kitchen garden are annuals and those annuals can change and you can make so many different designs and, and be artistic with your garden. This is like a sunray garden with the lemon jam in the center and the, the various rays coming out from the center. 
Um, so raised beds are a little bit more rigid and I can really understand why people do raised beds. They're, they're easier for urban gardens. They, they keep the rabbits out and there's many reasons to grow a raised bed. Um, yet sometimes I find that in the winter, which is um, half the year here in Vermont, a raised bed can look a little bit like a cemetery plot that you don't really know what's underneath those raised beds. And so I encourage you, if you do have raised beds, maybe not set them up um, in solid rows like this. So often raised beds are four feet wide and six feet long. And, and, and you really don't know what's underneath those mounds. But if you can create a little bit more whimsy and height and maybe some containers next to those raised beds, it softens the edges a little bit and, and makes it more fun. Um, other ways of doing raised beds are, are with stone or this wonderful uh, granite curbside, which was, was salvaged from sidewalks that were coming up in, in Sharon, um, Connecticut. And I love the idea of using stone for raised beds because it heats the soil. So in the spring, the gardener can get a jump start on the season. And in the fall, the, the stone holds the, 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 the warmth. And so the plants are less likely to, to be lost to frost. As, as easily, or something like the, ra the, the waddle fences, the old fashioned English waddle fences. And um, they're very hard to find waddle fences in this country because not many people grow willow, but these are from the Chanticleer Gardens in, in Pennsylvania. If you get a chance to go on tour in the Brandywine area of, of, um, of Pennsylvania, make sure to see the, the Chanticleer Gardens and they have a lovely kitchen garden and they also grow their own willow. So so every three years or so, they um, the wattle fence will rot and they'll rebuild the wattle fence and another example of their beautiful wattle fence gardens. Now I know this garden, this lecture is called the heirloom garden and I'm mostly showing you pictures of, of gardens that I consider look a little old fashioned. I love the way these, this arbor, this, this living willow arbor really um, accentuates the garden gate and these waddle fences make you feel like you're you're in um, maybe 18th century England and that's really what what I think of when when I think of a of an heirloom garden. Step number three paths. Um, paths are so important. Paths really define the bones of the garden and this is a path in Colonial Williamsburg and, and I love the way they've combined the, the straight intersection with the bricks going east, west, north, south to create those four squares but then also added to them by having the, the clamshells which, which create a little bit more of a meandering path through there. But, but do you remember that first picture that we saw that the orchard with the white bench in the background that Rosemary Beery designed. Well, I'd love to see a white bench right here at this very spot to, to have that focal point at the end of, of the garden. Um, but paths are really a great way to create a little organization. If this garden in Charlotte, Vermont didn't have these lovely flagstone um, stones indicating where the paths are, it might just look like a jumble of, of flowers. And so um, it may not be as geometric as the earlier path from Colonial Williamsburg, but they're um, certainly a way of defining that space. And here's another example of a path that I think is so lovely. And, and this path is, let's imagine this path goes from the driveway into the house and on the way you can have a basket and, and collect your lettuce and your peas and and your chicories and, and maybe some cut flowers for the table on your way into the kitchen or a garden path like, like this, which is in Charlotte, Vermont. And if you look closely, you see it really is a four square design with a focal point in the center. And a lot of these crops look like they've gone a little bit by, but the structure of the, of the path and then the, the granite stone holding those beds in uh, creates um, the formal quality to this lovely little kitchen garden. Uh, this is Hollister House Garden, and I, I trust you've all been to Hollister House. It's one of my favorite destinations. And um, they don't grow food at Hollister House, but I always get design inspiration. And I love the way they have taken the boxwood and, and created these 
these beds and paths and if they didn't have those wonderful wild um what am I talking about beds but we're talking about paths but I love the way they've allowed the volunteers in the paths to to rusticate the garden and and not be so formal like that other brick path that we saw and and they're not considered weeds they just do some some careful editing when when they clean up in the spring and then a lot of these these plants will grow into to some sort of wonderful unexpected wildness as you wander around the gardens in the fall so paths are also very good for dog training. This is when I was first starting out in my, my kitchen garden and my little dog, Bella, um, who was a cattle dog and she was full of energy, but she was also very easy to train. And I trained her um, by having her sit in the paths and um, learn the distinction between the bark path and, and the soil. So she wasn't likely to crush plants. And, and this is Bella about maybe mid-July and she's learned the difference and she's waiting patiently for me to take her for a walk. But these paths may look very wide and I design all my gardens to have four foot wide paths, which with, do seem very large um, in the spring when, when there's, there's maybe you want more room to grow your plants, but really by mid-August when you've forgotten to trellis up the, the melons and the squash and, and the cucumbers as I did this particular summer, um, you're, you're grateful to have that space in the paths. And one of the things I've learned about paths is that they can be changeable. So early on, I had this bark mulch path, and then I had um, a lot of flooding in my garden, and I kept losing the path. It would go downhill, and I'd have to replace it, and it just became a chore. And so I decided that I would change the path and put in stone, beautiful little gray river stone. So when it rains, the water actually flows through the garden. I raised the edges of the, of the beds up just a little bit, but I noticed a big difference in the, the textures of the garden and the color and, and really the beauty of the garden. I'm so much happier with the stone path than the bark mulch path. Um, and I realized it's kind of like changing the color in your kitchen or your living room that if you change it from a to tomato red to a, a lovely soft blue, it, it changes the way it feels in the garden. So step number four, fences and gates. And when I was in art school, we weren't allowed to turn a painting in and say it was finished and let it have, unless it had a picture frame around it. And I feel that way about uh, a fence around the garden, really choosing a fence um, that, that is aesthetic as well as, as something that fits into the landscape can really make a big difference in, in the feel of the garden in your landscape. And this is a lovely garden in Dorset, Vermont. And, and the picket fence won't keep out deer, but it really adds to the lovely ambience of the garden. And again, notice the four square and the, the trellis in the center for the centerpiece and the, the tables outdoor, the table and chairs outdoors for being able to eat al fresco in the garden um, and creating a gate that says that welcomes the gardener into that space and and um, so having a lovely fence as a picture frame around the garden and a gate that says welcome are, are really important elements to designing a kitchen garden this is a wonderful garden, again, in northern Vermont. And I love the, the simplicity of the, the basic raw picket fence. It's not painted, so there's not a lot of maintenance. And then that focal point in the center. And then this is what the garden looks like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I jumped ahead. I think we have a picture, there we go, um, of what the garden looks like in mid-August. And if you squint your eyes a little bit and, and pretend there's not a fence around it, it just pretty much looks like an ordinary, wonderful, beautiful garden. But with that fence, it creates a sanctuary space. And I've said that word a couple times because I really feel that when you're creating a beautiful kitchen garden, you're creating a space that, that nurtures you on so many levels. And, and so it's important to really put the time um, and thought into the garden. Oops, I keep jumping ahead. Um, so fences, um, you know, they can be natural or you can paint them a beautiful historic color like this Benjamin Moore um, blue and, and which will really accent the colors of the plants in your garden. And ugh, 
something's going on with my little snappy here. Um, the, the gates going into the garden is such an important element of the garden. This is a garden down the road from me in Manchester. Um, and I love the way it kind of has that Narnia effect. Do you remember that book, The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe? And you walk into that space and you're suddenly transformed into a different land. And that's how I feel when I enter into a beautiful gate such as this garden or, or this wonderful garden here. This is a picture from my new book, The New Heirloom Garden. And I love the way the gardener has put up, notice if you look closely under that, that arbor, there's, um, there's wire meshing there to keep the deer out. So it not only has that, that lovely effect of being able to enter into this magical space, but it also keeps the, the critters out of the garden. Another way to set up a garden, and again, this is more of an urban landscape with the terraced stone walls and, and the simple iron gate. So it doesn't have to be fancy, fancy. And notice the vertical elements that add drama and height to this lovely garden. Another example of, of gates and, and um, going into this, this garden, which is in, in also in Vermont. And, and the way this gardener has combined the, the flowers and the vegetables all in one space. And she doesn't have a gate, a, a garden gate or a fence, but she does have the, the wonderful rustic trellis that, that allows the gardener to go into that space and, and feel the transition from the lawn into the garden. Step number five, seeds and plants. Listen to your broccoli and your broccoli will tell you how to eat it. I, I love this quote because, um, well, okay, so it may sound a little woo woo to be listening to your broccoli, but I do feel that as a food gardener, as a kitchen gardener, as somebody who loves to cook, that I do wanna make sure that whatever I'm growing um, is treated with respect. And so uh, I don't smother my broccoli, my homegrown broccoli with cheese sauce. Instead, I'll bring it into the kitchen and um, really um, delicately dress it with a little butter and lemon sauce and really appreciate it because I really feel that as gardeners, this is really the essence that we need to treat our gardens with respect. And so what is an heirloom garden? Heir means inheritance and loom means tool. And it's a way to pass along something of value without written document or legal settlement. And in the case of an heirloom garden, this would be seeds. And we're losing so many of our heirloom varieties to, um, you know, well, GMOs to, um, to hybrid seeds. And I'm not going to get into the politics of seed because it would kind of lose the, the perspective here. But, but I do seek out heirlooms mostly because of flavor. As a cook, I love the flavor of the old fashioned Concord grapes and the, the heirloom tomatoes. And, and of course, the sweet Genovese basil and the, the um, Bloomsdale spinach. And one of the things I've, I, that prompted me to write the new heirloom garden was really because seeds are free. We have been somewhat brainwashed by seed catalogs to be buying seeds every year because there's so many varieties that we can grow and save and we don't have to be buying seeds, especially if you learn which seeds are open pollinated. And so, you know, looking at the catalogs is great. I, I always order way too much, but I've also learned that a certain percentage of seeds I save and, and for the following garden and I share with friends. And, and really the hybrid seeds were introduced in around 1950. So what defines an heirloom seed is something that's open pollinated um, and was developed prior to 1950, roughly, um, which is when hybrid seeds were, were introduced um, by many of the seed catalogs. And of course, the seed catalogs love to sell us hybrid seeds because the, you know, they're, they're, the season is longer, the stems are stronger, the blooms are bigger, the, you know, blah, blah, blah about all these different things about, about seeds. And that might be really important to you. And I have an 80-20 rule where I grow 80% tried and true and 20% 
different, new and different because it's worth trying something new. But I've learned that growing my own seeds is really fun. Um, I encourage you to be a seed saver. And, and this plant right here is a red deer tongue lettuce. Now, deer, red deer tongue is, is an old heirloom variety and I get my seeds um, from a company on the West Coast called Wild Garden Seeds. And I always let a few of the plants go to seed. And so often, especially with lettuce, and if it starts going bolting, bolting, we're letting it go to seed. So we usually yank it and put it on the compost pile and start another plant. But I have learned that I allow some of my lettuce plants to bolt and go to seed because they're beautiful. And one single lettuce plant will produce over a thousand seeds. So I never have to buy red deer tongue lettuce again, unless I want to. Um, but there's so many different seeds, especially if you're new at seed saving, starting with the legume family. This is a photograph from my book and um, Matthew Benson, who's a photographer, was, was a, is an absolute genius when it comes to, to set up and, and photography. And um, there's so many beautiful photographs in my book, thanks to him. But the legume family is, is really a great place to start. And all of us grow beans. And if you let just one or two plants go to seed and let those seed pods turn into dried seed pods and then um, harvest the, 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 the peas that you might have eaten instead um, and save them, you can regrow them the next year. Um, and it's fun. It's kind of like little Easter eggs. Look at these beautiful chocolate runner beans that, that grow um, at, in the front of my garden shed and, and what they look like when I open up the pods in the fall. And, and in, you know, heirlooms, there's so many wonderful old fashioned culinary herbs. I don't think culinary herbs have changed much over the centuries. And I often feel that if I can grow just one thing, I would grow culinary herbs. And I, I do, I grow a parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, chives, lovage, um, everything I can get my hands on. And I, I love making an herb cheese bread, which fills the house with a lovely fragrance. Um, or something like mescaloon. You know, we've really um, <laughs> been introduced to mescaloon, most of us, through the grocery store, those things that we buy in the, in the, in the clamshells that have absolutely no flavor at all. But when you're growing mescaloon in your garden, you're growing a rich tapestry of, of not just colors, but flavors. And, and it's a real tonic for your system when you can add chicories and dandelions and some of the bitter greens, the mustard greens into your diet in the spring. And so I encourage you to, to find different varieties of mescaloon and, and maybe not grow them all in a mixed packet but 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 grow them in individual rows so you can harvest them um, as they grow and mix them together in the salad bowl and something like rainbow chard is a favorite of mine it's a workhorse in the garden the more you cut the more it grows and it's so ornamental you can fit it into the perennial landscape into your flower borders as well as your vegetable garden um, and something like andy we've i've really um, become enamored with all of the the bitter greens and the chicory and ondye family and and they're especially good in the mid heat of the summer because they they they're from the Mediterranean so when lettuce isn't germinating you can always grow endive and and chicories and something like this gorgeous red iceberg lettuce where are you going to find red iceberg lettuce except in your own garden you're not going to find it in the grocery store and you're unlikely to find it in the farmer's market so I encourage you to to look beyond the ordinary to things you can grow that are extraordinary. All kinds of edible flowers are, are at the top of my list. I love nasturtiums. I, I grow 20 different kinds of nasturtium. I get a lot of my seeds from Select Seed in, in Connecticut. And, and the borage flower, one, one borage plant is plenty. And those, those brilliant blue flowers, there's nothing like them for garnishing a soup. Um, and comfrey leaves and all kinds of medicinal herbs. I at one time studied with an herbalist and, and learned how to make tinctures and and um, old fashioned salves and shampoos and creams. And it's not that hard. You can get a wonderful book by Rosemary Gladstar and, and maybe experiment by making some of your own um, wonderful, um, healthy um, ointments. And cranberry beans, we forget how hard it was for our ancestors to grow food. And we have the luxury of being able to, to choose what we want to grow. And something like cranberry beans are, are such a uh, you know, gorgeous bean to to um, un, 
uh, unpod for, I don't think that's quite the right word, but when you're sh shuck from, from their dried pods and, and then cook them up in, in a nice baked bean or, or stew them or, or lightly um, braise them and put them into salad with, with, with grains. Uh, there's so many ways to cook with beans and something like the Alpine strawberry to me is the, the classic heirloom plant to grow in a garden. I, I grow Alpine strawberry and, and often I will just sit on a bench in my garden and and have a handful of alpine strawberries and they don't you don't bite into a straw an alpine strawberry you let it melt on your on your tongue and you can just feel and taste and for me it brings it transports me like a memory back to my grandmother's garden so i highly encourage you to to grow alpine strawberries and all kinds of fruits you know we're we're losing so many of our heirloom varieties that back um, not too long ago, there were 5,000 different kinds of apple trees and, and now there's, there's less than 800. And so, and, and it's shrinking every day as, as our, our growers are focusing mostly on varieties that are um, you know, sellable and productive. And yet so many of us as home gardeners can be growing some of the old heirloom varieties. This is elderberry from my garden. I grow elderberry and it, it's a wonderful flower in the spring. And then in the fall, it grows these purple berries. And I usually have to harvest a few before the the birds take over, but I love to grow berries in my backyard because it brings in the wildlife and, and it keeps me happy and it keeps all the, the critters happy as well. Um, heirloom tomatoes need no introduction and no excuses either. I mean, none of them are, are beautiful. There's very rarely will you get an heirloom tomato that doesn't have some kind of, of defect or cat facing, but you know once you slice into it that it will be absolutely delicious. And the earliest heirloom tomatoes really go back, the, the earliest discovery of tomatoes, and I talk about this in my book, were purple tomatoes, tiny little purple tomatoes that were bitter and, and grew on long vines and were found in the Andes and, and were 400 times more powerful in lycospene than, than the, the sweet tomatoes that have been bred for our gardens. The sweeter the tomato, the less likely it is to be healthy. So the bitter tomatoes I've, I'm learning are the, the darker colored and the smaller ones are, are going to be the healthiest choice. Um, and whether you choose for flavor or nutrition, it's really up to you. But it, when it comes to potatoes, this you know, you get to try different varieties when you're growing your own garden. And so heirloom varieties such as the French fingerling and the Russian banana, and of course those Peruvian purple are, are just so much fun to grow and discover and taste and, and, and cook with in the garden and serve to your, your family and friends. Uh, I love this quote, as the single day is coming when a carrot will set off a revolution. And um, I feel that that's starting to happen. You know, we're really paying attention to food now way more than we ever did. And something like this purple carrot was not the original carrot and it was, it's been bred through the centuries to be yellow and orange and, and white even. And, and they don't have as much nutrition as the purple carrot, but, but they're certainly beautiful to serve and, and, um, and and I think it's nice to have a variety of different um, colors in our gardens. This is from my the rainbow um, garden in my book. So step number six, personality. How are you going to bring all these steps together and bring your own personality to the garden? And since I'm really focused on the art of growing food and, and what to grow for heirloom flavor and heirloom nutrition and heirloom seed saving properties, I, I feel that, that adding art to the garden will only enhance my experience and my pleasure. Um, this is Jan's garden and and I, 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 this, this is my quote that comes to mind. There's a fine line between art and junk because when Jan designs her garden, she doesn't really think about what she's doing except she's the one who put those raised beds up and has a lot of clever ideas. But I love the way Jan has put things in her garden that are meaningful to her. Look at the, the nest from the tree and the peace sign and, and um, the, the different um, bees, this is, the, she doesn't actually have bees in this, but you know, just different things that make her smile because when we smile, when we go in the garden, it makes us happy. So anything you put in your garden that makes you smile is absolutely 
great. Um, and maybe it's a little bit of old fashioned whimsy, something from your grandmother's garden, such as an old watering can that maybe has a hole in it and doesn't work anymore, but just putting it out there as a reminder of how um, your grandmother once loved her garden as much as you love your garden. Um, and having fun in the garden, adding playhouses for places to play with your, your children or your grandchildren or even your spouse or just yourself and, and maybe having a treasure hunt in your garden to, to encourage um, the kids to visit your, the children that come to visit your garden to find things so that they're touching and feeling and smelling and tasting and opening up all their senses so that they will also grow into loving a garden as much as you do. Um, providing a, a lovely entrance into the garden. This is a garden in um, Peterborough, New Hampshire, and I love the way this gate has been designed to mimic those round stones. And, and through that gate, you enter into that, that lovely hobbit house kind of garden. So creating a, a fairy tale garden is a, is a great way to invite um, magic to happen in the garden creating those arbors that create that, that transition from the lawn into the garden is, is also um, a, a great way to invite um, that magic to happen. And again, into that sanctuary space um, and a bench. If you, if you leave with just one thing today, I hope you'll add a bench in your garden so you can sit and enjoy that space and, and allow the, um, the beauty to just linger in your memory. A, a wonderful garden shed as well to, to have a, a space to, to have your garden tools and maybe this is a place where you keep a refrigerator for chilled drinks or, or uh, garden inspiration and invite your friends over for tea in the garden. Um, but inviting nature into the garden is really one of the most important things. Um, you know, our gardens are a place for, for us. We think of them as a place to, to nurture us, but really to invite uh, nature to also come to our spaces with birds and, and bird baths and bird houses and bird feeders and, and invite snakes and toads and um, I'd rather not have rabbits but I don't mind it when I do see rabbits and and but why do heirlooms really matter what what is the point of growing heirlooms well um, in my book I interviewed a number of heirloom gardeners including Roz Creasy who is one of my favorite um, mentors who has inspired me in so many ways as a as an ornamental edible gardener and she writes if you if I don't like the taste I'm not going to eat it there's a wide difference between varieties. And so flavor is number one on my list as well. Um, Marilyn Barlow, who um, has the, the select seeds in, in Connecticut, um, she says fragrance. The heirloom peonies around my house have no name yet. They have a fragrance that makes me weak in the knees and, and um, couldn't be so true. There's so many varieties that have been bred for stronger vase life, but we've really lost touch with the fragrance behind them. And, and and something like history, diversity, here today, gone tomorrow, unless we preserve something, it will disappear. So it's really important to start becoming a seed saver and being aware of what seed saving means and, and looking at some of these wonderful um, seed savers that are, are really um, creating an, a, a new culture for us as gardeners. Um, so in my garden, uh, in my book, The New Heirloom Garden, I also have designs. So I combine recipes and designs because I am really um, have one foot in the cooking world and one foot in the garden design world. And I have a design called the Arc of Taste, which is really developed by Slow Food USA and Slow Food Italy, where, where they have a list of 500 endangered um, species, including uh, garden varieties. And I encourage people to grow these in their garden and, and save the seed. This is actually a cardoon flower, very reminiscent of an artichoke. Um, um, and so learn to play with your food in the kitchen and the garden and, and, uh, and to share what you love with gardeners. As, as garden clubs, I know we, we all um, do the best we can in our communities and encourage um, beauty and bring inspiration by having classes, especially um, all the programs that you offer in the library. Um, and just remember to invite people into your garden and share what you love with others and, and play with your food in the garden and in the kitchen. And remember, there's really only two things in life that 
money can't buy true love and homegrown heirloom tomatoes. So that's the end and I want to thank you very much. I, um, I have designs and books and I teach classes and do lectures and you can find more about me on my website ellenogden.com and I'm going to stop sharing and answer your questions. Thanks Ellen, that was great. Appreciate it. We have a, we have a few questions here. Um, great presentation. Beautiful, beautiful photographs, I must say. Really gorgeous. Um, Diane is asking, can you explain what open pollinated is? Yes, open pollinated. So I don't go into too much, but I realized when I was getting to that slide that I probably should add this in the, in the um, lecture a little bit. Open pollinated seed means that it's seed that when you save it and you plant it again, it will um, produce a plant that's exactly like its parent. And so when you save an old fashioned bean, an old uh, you know, lettuce seed or whatever it is that you're growing, unless it's been cross pollinated, which happens with a lot of the cucurbit families, um, that, that seed will grow true to nature versus a hybrid, which has been more or less spliced in a laboratory so that the seed is not going to match its genetic parent plants and seeds and seed um, production has come so far along and I can't even begin to start describing some of the exciting crossbreeding of seeds right now. So it's not so black and white anymore. Um, and I encourage you to read Margaret Roach who did a wonderful article in the New York Times last Sunday about seeds and um, and some of these wonderful new small seed companies that are branching out and saving some of these land race seeds, et cetera, et cetera. So seeds is a whole nother topic, but it's a great question. And I encourage you to explore um, and learn as much as you can about seeds. Okay, you can probably see these too, but um, also Diane wants to know, what is a chocolate runner bean? How do you eat that? <laughs> I love that question. I asked the same thing. I found chocolate runner bean seeds in fruition seed catalog. And they actually look very much like a red runner bean. Um, and except I think the seed is the, the flowers are a little darker, but the hummingbirds love them and you can eat them. I mostly grow them as an ornamental. I grow them up the front porch. I grow them on an arbor in front of the, the garden shed. And so um, I actually grow them inside in the winter. Um, I, I have them growing right now in my living room. They're just fun. I love anything that's a vine. Okay. And what are some heirloom apples that taste good that are no longer grown for stores, but are good for our, um, heirloom, good for garden. our heirloom garden? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm not an orchard expert. So I, I'm going to say I, I can't really answer that for you okay. at the moment. I mean, you know, there's so many different varieties. There's the... Um, and they've got wonderful names. And so um, if you could do your own research and type in heirloom apples, there's um, Michael Phillips in New Hampshire is an organic air apple expert. And I'm sure he has some wonderful varieties. I happen to have an apple, an heirloom apple in my backyard, which has no name at all. It's a green apple and it's an old, old tree and it grows the best apples for making cakes and um but it's terrible for eating so i think the thing about heirloom apples that you need to remember is that they aren't necessarily good to eat but they're very specialized for sauce or for pies or for cakes or or whatever um there's tiny little apples that are that are great to put around a roast for roasting so it's a it's a wide world and it's a very exciting um um another topic to yeah 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 um, also, what's the, what is the name of the healthiest tomato? You mentioned a purple one in, in the Andes. Andes, yes. Well, th that particular tomato from the Andes, I'm sure is no longer in existence, right. but anything <laughs> that's small and purple um, is, and to my mind, is, is probably going to be healthier than a big red beefsteak tomato. Um, for years, I really liked the yellow tomatoes, but I've really started to learn that color in food really makes a difference in terms of nutrition. And, you know, it's a balance between are you growing for nutrition or for, for flavor? And I, I say, if you can do it both, that's the, that's the best. But that's a great question. You've got wonderful questions. Thank well, you. Well, Diane's got a lot of great ones here. And is the Peterborough, New Hampshire garden public or private? The one with the fairy-like doors? Oh, that's private. Yeah, private. that's a private okay. garden. 
And then Edward, we only have part. What is your, okay. Uh, I don't know what the rest of that is. What is your recommendation for an attractive yet? Effective fence. I oh, haven't figured it, it out yet. Yeah. Effective I have a heart trap. Against chipmunks and other small, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a terrible time with chipmunks. I, 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 I have no answer for that. I'm working on it. That's all I can say. I, I have, have a heart traps that I, I, you know, set every day and mm -hmm. um, move them, but we have to live with these things. I think Sorry. we have a terrible deer problem. You know, that's our, I mean, rabbits as well and chipmunks and et cetera, but the deer, do you have a very, Vermont is probably not as bad as nearly as what we have here. Mm. Yeah. I don't ha I not yet knock on wood yeah table um I don't have a deer problem um right. but I do know it's a it's a very serious problem for for most of you in in yeah. Connecticut New York and other states yeah I think that's it unless anybody has anything else or if we want to add any thank you so much this was a great program we really appreciate it and hopefully oh, everybody will check out your book because it's beautiful Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's very nice. Yeah. I wish I could see all of you. In, in I, I know. That's the <laughs> challenge. You're talking it would have been <laughs> pretty hard to have so many people on the uh, Zoom. Ellen, this, your, your knowledge is incredible. I mean, there was nothing that yeah. you couldn't answer. Beautiful. I couldn't believe it. And as, as the images, of course, were stunning. There's a lot of thank yous about your presentation. Um, I don't know how to be able to get you to see them, but um, and I will probably get lots of emails. I do want to say thank you very much. And I also want to tell everybody that this program was recorded. So if you have forgotten something that she said, don't worry. Please go to our website, chappaqualibrary.org, and you could um, see everything um, and hear everything that uh, Ellen said. So. Jennifer, it's been a pleasure again Thank working you. with you. Pleasure as always. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you, Joan. And it's been great. It's just you <laughs> had me riveted there. <laughs> I'm going to go you. cook. I'm going to go cook now. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone, for Thank coming. You.